Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. I uh, hope you'll bear with me today. I've been sick as a dog all week and I had a medical procedure on my spine today so I'm kind of kind of out of it. Um, but this isn't so much a how-to or anything like that. This is, I'm actually hoping I can get a lot more engagement of discussion on this particular one uh, because I kind of made some connections and I can't hop over to Australia or New Zealand or to the breeders of Europe to kind of get some answers and some discussion and some perspective on this. So I'm making this video, maybe it's not as great as some of my other videos, I think it'll still be very interesting to the people who are into this because I love the birds. I love falconry, I love to train and work with the birds, but the birds themselves fascinate me. The birds of falconry, the raptors of the world just, just have my heart. They absolutely do. And I love to ponder and think and understand. But you have to understand too, um, I'm thinking, you know, I'm gonna just, this is a very casual video. Um, as you can see from the woolly rhinoceros skull over there, <laughs> um, I have a, a background in paleontology and particularly with the Ice Age is the most recent time we're coming out of and so it's not just here are the birds of the world it's like where were the species or their closest ancestors from which they diverged a few thousand years ago not not even all that long ago and what we find particularly with all animals but particularly with birds a lot of the lineages that we associate with the region also existed in another region for example the easiest quickest example is vultures new world vultures all of them that we have today, closely related. And they're all uh, actually come from the line of sort of like wood storks and carrion eating storks, if you go back far enough. They're not closely related at all to the other diurnal raptors. Meanwhile, old world vultures, um, you know, they looks like a bald eagle with a bald head. I mean, you know, they, they, they come from that line of sort of related to hawks and sea eagles, and they have more grip in their feet and a lot more power. Uh, they fill the same role as carrion eaters, as cleaning up in the environment. So they both have basically bald heads, but they're not closely related. So we always have in our modern biology books, oh, the old world vultures and the new world vultures. But you know what? Here's the truth. We have, I, I don't know what's going on in the old world, but in the new world, we have at sites like the La Brea Tar Pits and different places, we have sites with tons of vultures from both the Old World and New World lineages. We got them both here. And so for whatever reason, in the past 10, 12,000 years, whether out competition or disease or who knows what, but the species of vultures we have here now are all just from one family line. But, uh, you know, they used to be from two. So that's a, that's a simple example. Uh, when it comes to taxonomy, when it comes to looking at genetics, we, people don't care about birds. And if they do, it's like peregrine falcon, right? Or, you know, so it's something fancy. The snowy owl. That's a bird that, you know, the harpy eagle. There's a bird that somebody out there is going to get a grant, sequence the genome of a species like that. But there's all kinds of amazing birds that we know some of their taxonomy and their relationship and some of their genetics, but nobody's doing anything on it. And people aren't as crazy as me, so they're not just sitting around huh, thinking about it. So, for example, uh, here's a couple I, I encourage you to go down the rabbit hole, try to do some digging. Um, the relationship between the gray hawk of North America and the red-shouldered hawk, or the relationship between the broad-winged hawk and the roadside hawk of Latin America. You, you start looking at those. And here's one of the things that you, sometimes I have these moments that kind of give way to this video. Sometimes you could have closely related species that because of coloration, like the actual pigmentation that we don't recognize right off the bat how closely related they are. But if you look at enough images of both of them, all of a sudden certain patterns of, of feathers, certain markings that may be wildly different colors, but the patterns are the same. You start to go, huh. And that was why a long time ago, I was noticing how similar actually Oplomato falcons, which are an amazing, uh, you know, all throughout South America, Central America, Mexico, and barely into the United States, these amazing, beautiful falcons. And uh, I was like, wait a minute, they have a lot in common with New Zealand falcons, uh, which are other side of the world, but not only in, in certain patternings 
which I know you're like, they look totally different. Don't look at the colors. Look at certain patterns at certain ages. But also, their, uh, their training, the complaints of falconers who have flown New Zealand falcons and falconers who have flown Apomatos are almost identical. And I'm like, wait a minute. And the fact that they'll hunt as a cast, both of them, wait a minute. And then I looked and, well, luckily for me, those are species that people have done some genetic work and so we do know for a fact they're extremely closely related and it's like well <laughs> that's weird how strange two close cousins on the other side of the world and i just left it at that but then it's been bugging me it's been really bugging me and uh how who went where who came from where if you look at the oplomato falcon just its coloration there's a lot of closely colored birds in latin america that seem to be closely related, and most particularly the orange-breasted falcon, which I would kill to fly one or even work with one as an education bird. And I'm sure it'll never happen, but that's that's one of my dream birds. Uh, and the bat falcon, which again, very similar colors, very similar, seemingly similar patterns. But if you really get looking at the proportions and the patterns and the colors, you're like, oh no. It's a very different kind of orange. It's a more r deep, rusty, reddish orange on the orange-breasted and the bat falcon. And so that when I kind of looked into it, it's like, oh, they're not related closely to them at all. It's just convergence. For some reason, falcons in certain parts of Latin America, there's something that favors that coloration. And an apomato comes from a very different line than the orange-breasted and the bat falcon. And it's like, we look like we're all closely related, but he's not, okay? And the New Zealand falcon uh, is perfectly suited for the different coloration of habitats in New Zealand. And it's really, after the host seagull went extinct, it really is the dominant uh, multi-role raptor of New Zealand. Uh, you know, the, the swamp harrier uh, um, it fills fewer roles. Uh, but the, the, and, and so it's just kind of interesting. But I was thinking, who, who came from where then? Who's related to who? Is a New Zealand falcon related to an apomato, or is an apomato related to a New Zealand? Who who came from where? And I'm like, there's got to be more to that story still surviving, right? And I was just looking uh, this past week and digging a little deeper on Australian brown falcons. And I will be doing a lot more digging. But Australian brown falcons, which have got to be about the most stupid name anybody could... It's a brown falcon. Really? This amazing, dynamic, uh, 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 you know, multi-biome, non-niche, highly adaptable falcon, and you call it the brown falcon. Some of them are almost black. Some of them are pale to near white and everything in between. They're in New Guinea. They're in Australia, all different parts from from uh, forested areas to hyper-arid desert areas. They're in Tasmania, and it's like... New Guinea, Australia, Tasmania. My little brain's going, and then here's New Zealand over here. I'm, did I say that right? Have I said New Zealand too early? My apologies. New, New Guinea, Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand. And I started looking at them because I saw a few pictures in, in, in some of my research. I've never been to Australia. I know, it's sad, huh? Got a wallaby hide right there. I've got kangaroo skeletons coming out my ears that I've articulated. I have so many marsupial skeletons. Never been to Australia, but I, so I've never thought of it. I just thought of them as maybe kind of like a prairie falcon of, of the new world. No, look at them. First of all, their legs are ridiculously, their tarsi are way too long for a, for, for a normal, like if you think of a prairie falcon, a peregrine falcon, a lanner as kind of a standard falcon shape, then no, these guys have, um, have, have wings that are too long tails that are too long and legs that are far too long uh, for, for, for a standard desert falcon shape. And I was thinking about it, I'm like, oh, geez. And then I started thinking about uh, some of their hunting tactics. I'm like, oh, yeah, they will at times team up with their mate and just go kind of in the semi-arid savanna <clears throat> and, you know, go together. And I'm like, and some of the brilliant intelligence shown, they are some of those that will have been documented when there's a brush fire going and it's scaring prey out. They're like, hey, they'll go down and they will pick up a burning stick, a burning branch, go take it somewhere else 
and start a fire to corral and 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 burn off some of that top growth to expose even more prey. So they didn't make the fire, but they're one of the raptors that have been seen. And I'm like, Aplomados have been seen doing that as well. Huh. And I'm not saying that uh, an animal can learn, but still that got me thinking. And so I just started pouring through pictures and brown falcons. I've talked to uh, folks in Australia who work with raptors before. Uh, I've had some that came out to America back in 2007 and had a chance to talk a little bit more about brown falcons. Uh, a lot of the areas in the Indo-Pacific, falconry is illegal, but a lot of times people will do rehabilitation, will use falconry techniques to train and fly and get some of these birds up and going. I'm desperately hoping that there are some uh, Tasmanian or Australian folk who might see or be tipped off to this channel who can weigh in and give some input and insight into what I'm talking about this. Please, please, please do in the comments if, if that is the case. Also, I know sometimes birds uh, from other countries are bred elsewhere. I am not aware of brown falcons being bred uh, or, or existing outside of Australia. New Zealand falcons are. And so please, if you have worked with New Zealand falcons, if you want to weigh in on this in any way, no matter where you're from, I would greatly appreciate it. But when I was looking at some of these, in the new world here, typically, not always, but typically, uh, as you get further north with our Oplomatos, they get paler and paler up here. Not always, but that's largely the case. Here in Texas, you see an Oplomato. It's not going to be the vibrant orange of a Peruvian. So in other words, it kind of seems the closer you get to the equator, the more fiery orange you get on the Oplomatos. But uh, some of these northern ones that I've seen, wildlife photographers have just taken pictures where they've been out and about in Texas or wherever, in southern Arizona, and they see wild Oplomato. And I'm like, geez, that patterning, the dissipation of pigment on the chest and on the, the brow ridge, everything, I'm like, that looks like an Oplomato on a brown falcon, on some of these brown falcon pictures I've seen. And even though the colors aren't the same, I don't care about the colors. Colors are a bit more random. Uh, new patterning, the, the math that, that tells where pigment should be put is less likely to generate new mathematics for that dissipation than new colors. New colors are easier. New shades are easier for genetics. So, oh, here's something new. But patterns are going to last longer with colors related species than coloration will. You you have common uh, cousins here and you put them in the jungle and you put them in the desert. What I'm saying is coloration is going to change before the basic mathematics of pigmentation are going to change. And that's what I see when I'm looking at these brown falcons. I am seeing a, a close kinship with Oplomatos and with, uh, and with New Zealand falcons, which would make geographic sense uh if whatever common ancestor there was you know if it was going through southeast asia and so now i need to go through and see what southeast asian falcons might still exist um but there's this whole lineage and then there's a whole diversity of pigmentation even in australia with the brown falcon like i said from from nearly black to nearly white and everything in between but even when you look under the, some of the wings especially uh, some of the closest that that have some of the same math in some of the very specific feather groupings have some of the same math of pigmentation to the New Zealand falcon are some of the brown falcons that I've seen online in Tasmania. And I'm like, well, that's the closest to New Zealand. So my hypothesis then that would that would make sense. So what I'm looking for in this video, so I'm bringing up this point. Uh, if you have any experience with brown falcons in any capacity, uh, captive breeding, wildlife rehabilitation. If you're just, if you're a birder or just a, a regular bloke in Australia who just likes watching them and is seeing them, if you've flown them or trained them in any capacity, I'm desperate to get more information on how they act, how they think, how they hunt, so we I can have a better basis for this because. I can't find anybody who has done any genetic work on brown falcons, and yet they really have an incredible range. So um, that is why I made this video. It's just some random Ben thoughts that I wanted to bring up, wanted to share in the hopes of reaching out, and in the hopes that um, that, that can 
that between who knows who knows who on the internet, we can get more information and kind of have more of a conversation about this. So uh, this isn't my regular weekly video, so I hope you'll forgive that I'm sick and that this is more of just a Ben Woodruff rant. Um, I hope you understand that and I uh, hope we can get some good information on this. And as always, happy hawking.